Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is Emily Clark, Information Specialist for the NCCMT. I'm a coordinator for the Spotlight webinar series brought to you by the National Collaborating Centre for Methods and Tools. Thank you so much to those of you who have joined us this afternoon for the Spotlight webinar series. Today we will be featuring the online training modules for integrating sex and gender in health research. Uh, we'll quickly review a few housekeeping items before we get started. Uh, please see the chat section on the bottom right-hand side of your screen in WebEx. Uh, you can post any questions or comments that you have during the webinar. We will have a designated Q&A session at the end of the presentations, uh, but please feel free to post any questions or comments that you have during the webinar. We will try and answer these as we move along uh, and definitely come back to them at the end as well. Uh, please post your comments um, in the chat section to all participants, as other participants may have the same questions that you have. Uh, today we recommend using a wired internet connection as opposed to wireless. And if you have any connection issues today, you can use either the WebEx 24-7 helpline. And Rowan Ferran is also logged in and you can message her with any uh, technical difficulties you might be having. She is on board for tech support. Uh, following today's presentation, the PowerPoint presentation will be made available in both English and French um, on the NCCMT SlideShare account. The audio recording will also be posted on our YouTube account um, in English. We will have these posted usually when, within about a week or so of today's presentation, so hopefully by the end of next week. Uh, we now have our first polling question of the day. Uh, we are interested to see uh, how many people are joining us today. So um, if anybody's joining as a group, please let us know. The polling question should show up in the right-hand side of your screen. Make sure that you select your answer and then also um, hit submit uh, so that the answer gets recorded as well. That's great. And Rowan, I will close the poll when this is ready. And it looks like um, most people are joining alone, but we do have a couple of groups as well, and that's really great to see. This is nice when it's a, an interactive experience as well. Um, so thank you so much. I would like to officially welcome everybody to the NCCMT Spotlight on Methods and Tools series. Um, this is the 34th episode of the series. Um, we will be featuring, as I mentioned, the online training modules for integrating sex and gender in health research. Uh, we'll post links to the registry page for this tool um, in the chat section. Um, since you can't actually interact with links on the slides on your screen. So anytime we include links, they will be in the chat section for you. For those of you who may be unfamiliar with the NCCMT, we're actually one of six NCCs across Canada. Um, we are located at McMaster University in Hamilton. Um, all of the NCCs are funded by the Public Health Agency of Canada. The other NCCs, um, as you can see on your screen, have focuses that are more on specific topics within public health. Here at Methods and Tools, we are looking at uh, improving access to and developing methods and tools that can be used in all areas of public health. So we have a bit of a unique perspective there. We do offer many products and services through the website, um, one of which be, is the, uh, the registry of Methods and Tools. We are featuring a uh, tool that is available in the registry during this webinar. Um, there's also a number of online learning opportunities, uh, for example, our online learning modules. We offer in-person workshops as well, um, and as well as networking and outreach so we can do visits to your sites as well um, if there's something that comes up. Um, our second polling question of the day, we're interested to see how familiar you are with uh, the online learning modules for uh, integrating gender and sex into health research. Um, whether you are familiar with it, um, if, or sorry, not familiar with it, if you've heard of it, or if you've actually used some of the modules already in your practice. So um, I see the responses coming in. Um, a number of people are not familiar, but there are actually a few who have used it, so that's really great. Um, we'd love during the discussion portion to hear your perspectives as well, so that's, um, that'll be really helpful as well. Um, and for those of you who are not familiar, we hope you'll be a lot more familiar by the end of this presentation. So I am very pleased today to uh, introduce our presenter. Uh, Crystal Van Hoof is the Assistant Director for the Institute of Gender and Health um, at CIHR. And we're very, very pleased, Crystal, to, for your presentation today. I will now pass the ball over to you and you can take it from here. 
Great. Thank you so much. I'm really excited to be here and to talk about our online modules and why they're important, um, hopefully, to everyone that's on the webinar today. So, as you mentioned, I'll be talking about our online modules, but more than talking about the modules, I'll probably be talking a little bit more about the actual content within the modules with the hope that I'll pique your interest and you'll find that this seems like something that's useful to you and you'll decide to actually do the modules and uh, for your effort you will get one of our certificates. So hopefully people decide to do that. Um, so I am from the Canadian Institutes of Health Research, which if you are a health researcher, you've surely heard of us. If not, we are the Canadian government organization that funds health research. Now the Canadian Institutes of Health Research is made up of 13 institutes that fund research into st strategic priority areas for Canadians. We are, of course, the Institute of Gender and Health, but it's important to understand that that's a little bit of a misnomer. We should perhaps be called the Institute of Sex, Gender, and Health. And if you don't know the difference between sex and gender, I will explain that quickly in a moment. So these are our, as an institute, so the Institute of Gender and Health, or IGH, as you see here, these are our three strategic directions. These are the things that we sort of exist to do. The number one thing that we do is integration. So we try to uh, convince health researchers, uh, health research funders, journals uh, in Canada and abroad that integrating sex and gender into health research makes it more rigorous science. It's not about uh, necessarily just doing the right thing, although it certainly is, but it's also, it makes better science, and we have lots of examples as to why that is, and some of them I'll share with you today. Innovation is really about innovating in terms of the methods that are used for sex and gender integration in science, and I'll get a little bit into that today, but not too much because I think that those things are very specific to your field area, and I would encourage you to, if you're interested in very specific uh, questions about methods, to check out our training modules and do the one that's uh, closely, most closely related to your area of research or interest. And impact is where we try to ensure that the research that we fund actually has real-world impact in, onto the health of, of Canadians. So that's through what we would call knowledge translation, which I hope that most of you are familiar with, and I know that NCCMT is. So you all filled out a registration, and a lot of you filled out what you aim to get from today, and these are a few highlights uh, I heard or read, you want to increase your knowledge about sex and gender as relates to whatever area it is that you're coming from, uh, better understanding of how to conduct good health research that incorporates sex and gender, achieve learning objectives of the module, so there are, there are three learning objectives for each module, which I'll talk about in a minute, um, ideas for inclusion of gender into data collection, uh, learn just about the modules, and see how you can apply these principles of applying sex and gender to the work that you do. So I basically synthesize those into three different areas. I think people want to increase their knowledge about the topic generally. You want some direction on how to do it, and then you want to access some resources that can actually help you get started. So from there, I developed my objectives for this presentation, which are to really make the case for why it's important to integrate sex and gender into health research and, and policy, and uh, so in terms of increasing knowledge. Uh, to support this case that I'm making with some examples, which will hope, hopefully give you some examples of how it's been done in the past, which can provide you with some direction on where you might start in your work. And to actually shape the path uh, by providing you with some resources and making it a little bit easier for you to get started. So with that, here are some questions that I'm hoping you might think about as I go forward over the next you know, 50 minutes or so. Um, think about how all of what I'm talking about relates to your work. So how might both sex and gender impact health outcomes in the work that you do? What sex-related and gender-related variables could you actually measure or should you actually be measuring in your work? How can you power your studies, if you're doing studies, to detect sex and or gender differences and be actually able to tell if the outcome is related to sex or related to gender or both, and are you sure that you are actually able to tell the difference? Consider, will your initiatives or your interventions or, or whatever it is that you're working on 
serve to exploit, accommodate, or actually positively transform gender norms. And if you find that your interventions or initiatives might actually be at risk of exploiting gender stereotypes, is there a way that you can adjust them to actually try to get to that transformative place where you're uh, addressing the underlying causes of gender inequities? And finally, can your interventions or initiatives be designed to improve the underlying causes? So that's what I was saying with number four. So that should be really the gold standard if you're working in that area. If you're working in you know, basic science, biomedical science, that's really not where you're at. But further along the line, uh, downstream, I think that's, that's really the gold standard of what we're looking for. So I talk a lot about sex and gender-based analysis, or SGBA, so just to, to say that if I say SGBA, that's what I'm talking about. When I say sex and gender-based analysis, and I say that you know all health research should consider or apply sex and gender-based analysis, that doesn't mean that I think that gender is relevant to every single study or that sex is relevant to every single study. What it means is you need to consider whether or not either or both are at the beginning stages. And you have to have a really good reason for saying that it's not, and you need to be able to rationalize that and explain it and justify it in your, in your applications and to yourself, of course. So another important distinction is the distinction between gender equity versus sex and gender in science. So when I talk about SGBA, and this is, this is perhaps unique to CIHR in a sense, you might hear other government departments like Health Canada talk about SGBA or GBA+, plus, which is gender-based analysis plus, uh, or status of women talk about that, oftentimes what they're talking about is gender equity, whereas we're talking about the integration of sex and gender in health and in health science. So when we talk about, and of course both are interesting and both are important, and we're engaged on both sides, but I just want to be clear what I'm talking about right now. So when we at CIHR talk about gender equity, we're really referring to who receives the funding. Are men receiving the funding? Women receiving the funding? Are we asking the right questions to determine what the gender of the applicants actually are? Probably not, I would say. We're probably just asking male and female, and we should not be doing that, but I'll get to that later. And when we talk about sex and gender in science, we're talking about who or what is actually being studied. Do we know the sex of the cells that we're studying? Are we including male and female animals in the study? Are we including women and men in the study and people with diverse gender identities in the study? And are we disaggregating that data? That's what I mean when I talk about SGBA or sex and gender-based analysis. Gender equity is important, but it's not what I'll be talking about today for the most part. So we like to say, and this is almost our motto, every cell is sexed and every person is gendered. So what does that mean? I said I would, I would provide you with this distinction. Uh, some people know, some people don't, some people might have some sense but don't entirely uh, have a clear picture. So this is how we like to describe it, that gender is, a social, is the socially constructed roles, behaviors, expressions, and identities of girls, women, boys, men, and gender diverse people. Sex is the biological attributes of humans and animals, including physical features, chromosomes, gene expression, hormones, and anatomy. So if you're a basic scientist and you are doing your study in mice and rats, I don't want to read a journal article that talks about their gender. I want to hear about their sex, and if you're dealing with humans, I want to hear about their sex and their gender. Hopefully both will be considered if we're talking in the clinical research stage. But that's just to give you a very brief explanation of the difference between sex and gender. Gender is a little bit more complicated. Um, it's a multi-dimensional concept. So I think whenever we talk about gender, most people have a sense in their mind of what they think that we mean by that. And oftentimes they think of gender identity. So things like, are, do you identify as a man? Do you identify as a woman? Do you identify as trans? You know, whatever it might be. That's what I think most people think about. Now, other aspects of gender are things like roles. So your actual behavior that might be determined by your society, your culture, your religion. It influences how you act, how you dress, what your role in the family is, the types of jobs that you might select, depending on how old you are, when you were born, where you were born, where you live now. Are you in a city? Are you in the country? There's so many different things that can go into what we consider to be masculine or feminine roles in a culture. Relations is really important. It's about the interpersonal relationships that you might have in your family, in your relationships, at the workplace, with your boss, with your subordinates. All of those things can be 
can be changed and mediated through gender. And we have institutionalized gender, which is the distribution of power that's political, in the education system, any sort of system that you might be interacting with. How is gender institutionalized into those areas of society and how can it actually shape social norms and change the sort of direction of individual people's lives? So in a nutshell, gender is complex. It's relational. Gender doesn't exist in a vacuum. It exists between people in comparisons to other things. It's intersectional, so it intersects with other characteristics and issues that people are dealing with on an individual level. It's non-binary, it's not just man, woman. It's, it's everything in between and outside and not neither, or maybe sometimes this and maybe sometimes that. It's socially constructed, you're not born uh, thinking that girls uh, wear pink and boys wear blue. It's socially constructed. And it can change over time, over the course of an individual's life and over the course of a culture as it evolves. So talking about intersectional, just to make sure we're on the same page, when we talk about intersectionality, this is really important that humans are shaped by the interaction of different social locations. So that can mean their ethnicity, their ind indigeneity, their gender, their class, sexuality, geography, age, ability, migration status, religion, so many different things interact and interact with gender to create a different experience of the world. So put simply, inequities that people experience are never the result of single distinct factors. They're the outcome of intersections of different social locations, power relations, and experiences. So hopefully that was a good 101 for everybody on sex and gender so that we're all a little bit on the same page so you know what I'm talking about. So I thought I would, I would give you some thoughts and some examples of why this is important now in particular, because there's a lot of things happening right now, so I wanted to just let you know sort of where we're at in our goals to, to integrate sex and gender and what others are doing around the world and how those things might actually affect you. So my question is always, why not until now? Uh, this is a really great timeline from Marjorie Jenkins, um, so professor of medicine at Texas Tech. And uh, she's shown that, you know, if you look at how health research happens, you've got in the cell-based sort of studies, in the preclinical research stage, 80% of the, the studies that are being done in cells, 80% the male is male sex or not reported. They don't even know or they don't look or they don't report what the cell, sex of the cell was. And when you go into animal-based study, based studies, 75% at least, and that can actually go up depending on the area of research, uh, is done only in male animals. Then when you have human trials, 60% of the trials are done in males, and or 60% of the participants are male. And then when you actually look at clinical care, women are actually using clinical care more than men. So as Marjorie puts it, a pipeline that does not represent all healthcare consumers, right? So right up until the, you know, the end point here, you're not seeing a lot of female physiology being tested. So you can see this is in different areas of, of science. These are actually animal uh, studies. All those gray bars in the, in the different areas are where they haven't actually specified if the animals were male or female. And then you can see the red bars are where it, the studies were male only. So those guys in the middle there, uh, I know I've got physiology, pharmacology, and endocrinology circle, but I would argue neuroscience is kind of one of the bad kids as well. Uh, and we know that there are sex differences in these areas, huge sex, di sex differences in particular that are very well documented and have been in the news quite a bit in pharmacology. So very interesting that when we're looking at the preclinical stage, not a lot of female physiology is being studied. So sex drug, sex drug interactions, according to the FDA's Office of Women's Health, women or females are, have nearly double the risk to develop an adverse drug reaction, reaction compared to men. We know that acetaminophen is flushed from a woman's body 60% more slowly than in men, and yet there are no sex-specific dosage recommendations. We don't see a different dose on the back of your Tylenol bottle for women versus men but we know that it's affecting women differently and staying in their bodies longer than men. So this was a study that, the, that um, the, the General Accounting Office in the States did, and they, they did a study of drugs, prescription drugs that were taken off of the market because of bad side effects between 97 and 2000, and they found a, there were 10 drugs that were taken off the market because of adverse side effects, and eight out of those 10 posed more of a threat to women. 
So they're actually, we've been putting out this, this old number for so long, they're actually in the process right now of redoing that study to see if there's any difference. So that'll be very interesting to see. They, they've promised in, the, in this year that we'll see that. So here's an example of a drug, and I think it's the only one that I can think of, where Health Canada actually has a different, um, a different dosage recommendation for men versus women. The dosage is actually half for women. So another thing that we, that we know is that women outlive men, and this is a really important thing to consider when we're looking at how health research. Look at these numbers. For every 100 uh, women who are 60 plus, there's only 84 men who are 60 plus. For every 100 women who are 80 plus, there's only 61 men. So this is a huge health issue. What can we do in the science to figure out why and how do we change this? So what we do know is that momentum is building in a lot of different areas, and I'll give you some examples. So all of these countries that I've listed here, or at least the, the research institutions that I've listed here from various countries, are doing something on integrating sex and gender into science. Um, we know that last year, last year the NIH um, put a, uh, made a requirement that sex as a biological variable be required of uh, animal studies that they fund. And if you weren't going to include animals of both sexes, you had to have a really good reason why not. So that happened in 2016. In 2009, for those of you who apply for funding at CIHR, you know that we added what we like to call uh, the box, which is it asks you if you integrate sex or gender into your study and to explain why or why not. Um, we developed, the, the Institute of Gender and Health developed and launched our, started launching our training modules in 2015. And then uh, CIHR took those training modules and has created a, a modified shorter version for the new CIHR College of Reviewers, uh, which, which was created in 2016 and will roll out this year. And uh, in, I guess it was the fall of last year, the CIHR Ethics Committee approved an action plan to integrate sex and gender-based analysis better across how CIHR funds its research, and that's actually being rolled out in 2017. So more will be coming on that soon. So here's another example of momentum that's building. So this is in 2015. The medical degree at McGill University was actually put on probation for, and now to be clear, this was for a number of reasons, but one of those reasons was that over the last five years, the survey, the questionnaire that's, that's filled out by students, reported inadequate instruction in women's health and family and domestic violence and, there's, and found that there was, there's been no discussion on this particular topic at the new curriculum executive level. So they were, their medical school was actually put on probation because of this issue. So that's really important. Also important is that it was the students that were demanding instruction in this. So the, the education is not necessarily keeping up with what students believe to be important and they are, they are believing that sex and gender-based analysis uh, is actually something that they want to know about and is important to their to their studies. So in terms of research ethics, we've gotten a number of calls from research ethics boards about survey questions on population health surveys. Um, we've had researchers call us, and we actually had one researcher who had their population health survey rejected by an ethics board because they were asking a question that said, do you, con uh, it said, um, uh, what is your gender? And it had male and female. And so the ethics board rejected it, and then the, the the researcher resubmitted with, what is your gender, male, female, other? And it was rejected again. And finally, the researcher called me. Now, I don't know why the RIB didn't give them more direction on this, but anyway, called me and said, well, what's the problem? And, and I said, well, there's several problems. One, you're saying male and female when maybe those are the words that we tend to use for sex, uh, and maybe you want to say man, woman. And then really, by only putting other, it's it's really suggesting a binary in terms of what the options are. What is other, right? There's plenty of other options that you could include there. And then my other question is, why are you asking the question? Do you actually want to know biology, or do you want to know how someone's interacting in society and how they're treated? And, or do you want to know both, right? And, and what, what, is this, what is this information going to get you, and what's the best way to ask it? And maybe you need to start there first before just plugging in the question, right? So the Canadian census, there was a big hoopla because they essentially did the same thing, right? I think they asked, what's your sex? But then they had male, female, other, right? And I think they had other. I'm not even entirely sure. But this was a lot of complaints about that. Uh, Health Canada inclusion of women uh, plus SGBA, they have guidelines on this. The CIHR Standing Committee on Ethics, as I mentioned, approved the SGBA action plan. And we're actually currently planning a webinar 
uh, on SGBA with the Secretary on Responsible Conduct of Research. So they're looking at how they should adjust their um, advice on how to interpret the Tri-Council policy statement on ethics for and responsible conduct of research for researchers. So this is just something to consider when you sort of you might be thinking, well, what does ethics have to do with it? These are questions that we've been raising with ethics boards and with researchers. So if we know that there are sex differences across just about every area of human physiology, is it really ethical to conduct clinical research on human women if no preclinical research was conducted in female animal cells or tissues? So you're essentially, you know, treating women like guinea pigs. There's been no you know, studies in female physiology, but there's been plenty in males before you go into the clinical research stage. So, you know, how is this ethical? And then on top of that, is it really ethical to recruit the female clinical trial participants without telling them that there's no preclinical research data on physiology that shares their sex, right? So there's also movement in reporting standards. The European Association of Science Editors has developed the Sex and Gender Equity in Research Guidelines, or SAGER guidelines, which are guidelines that they are promoting and advocating for journals to take up uh, as guidelines for their editors and for their contributors to say that you must you know, at least identify the sex of the cells and the animals that, that you're using. You must disaggregate your data by, by sex and that you should look at gender if, if it's a, a variable that, that makes sense in the study. Um, the Canadian Journal of Public Health has already implemented uh, guidelines to this in, that are similar to this, as well as the Journal of Neuroscience Research, um, all in the last, uh, I would say, six months this has happened. And IGH, we're currently working to bring the SAGER guidelines to Canada and to get Canadian journals to take up the guidelines. So this was in the news in September. Um, this is uh, Jackie Gagan, who's an, on the editorial board of the Canadian Public uh, Health Journal, uh, Canadian Journal of Public Health, sorry. This is an international issue about making sure the evidence that is in peer-reviewed journals reflects the reality of both men and women. You can't do that if women are not included in those trials. Makes a lot of sense, seems pretty simple. So obviously this was an issue that was taken up by CBC, they agreed. Um, so then you have uh, the Journal of Neuroscience Research who put out an entire uh, issue uh, called uh, An Issue Whose Time Has Come, Sex, Gender Influence on Nervous System Function. And in, uh, in the beginning, there was an editorial from the editor-in-chief that said, neuroscience today is at a crossroads. Do we continue the status quo and ignore sex as a biological variable, or do we acknowledge that sex influences the brain at all levels and address the major gaps in knowledge? At the Journal of Neuroscience Research, we recognize that sex fundamentally influences the brain and have now established policy requiring all authors to ensure proper consideration of sex as a biological variable. And that was in November. So why is SGBA important to you in particular? So we like to say that, when, that women, men, and gender diverse people are equal, but when it comes to our health and well-being, differences matter. And this is really important because you know, at least in the past, and I hope that this is changing, there's been a view that, you know, if we just treat everyone the same, then that will be just and that will be equal and that will be fair. But if everyone isn't the same and you treat them the same, it's likely that you're going to benefit some people more than others. So that's why we like to say that we're equal, but differences matter. So I'm going to give you a few examples. Hopefully, there's something for everyone. If not, there are plenty more examples in the training modules and in the resources that I'm going to link you to at the end. Um, so a few did you know. In Canada, men die younger than women, while women experience a heavier burden of chronic disease. At least one quarter of individuals with eating disorders are men and boys, yet most of the treatments are designed for women and girls. There tends to be a belief that women and girls are the ones that are experiencing eating disorders exclusively, and while the numbers are higher in women and girls, we certainly know that this is something that affects men and boys, so how do we address those issues for them as well? We know that men are more likely to smoke, which may be because of gender, I don't know, but a woman who smokes the same amount as a man is actually 20% more likely to develop lung cancer, which is related to sex. So how do these things interact? New fathers may face work-family conflict, lack of sleep, and fatigue, which can have negative effects on safety at work. So we often think about mothers after they give birth, but we don't often think about how the health of fathers can be affected after they return to work after a baby's born. 
We know that musculoskeletal disorders affecting the upper body occur five times more frequently in women. Is this because of the types of jobs that they're doing? They're not lifting heavy things, but they're lifting small things. They're doing repetitive tasks. Or is it more to do with how men and women's muscle fibers differ? Because we know that there are physiological differences at the level of muscle fibers between men and women. Paternal age, health, and exposures in the environment can affect, the off can affect offspring health. But few men get the you're not getting any younger talk, and fewer are prescribed prenatal vitamins. Should they be? I don't know. Have we looked into it? Well, here's one example. We know that in, in a mouse model, fathers, the mouse fathers, uh, can genetically transmit acquired diet-induced metabolic disorders. So if the father has a, has, a, has a metabolic disorder because of what they've been eating, that can actually be genetically transferred through the sperm. This is, a, this is a study that we're funding through our Advancing Boys and Men's Health Research teams, Fathers Lasting Influence, Molecular Foundations of Intergenerational Transmission of the Paternal Environment. So this is from Dr. Janice Bailey at Laval University, and what she's looking at is DDT use in South Africa that's being transferred to the Arctic through natural weather currents, and this transmission is actually creating uh, bioaccumulation in the animals that are being eaten by individuals that are living in the Arctic, and that that uh, DDT is actually causing problems for the sperm epigenome and can actually be transferred to the offspring and cause issues in the offspring. So her research question is to say, can folate supplementation, which we know is often prescribed to women when they're pregnant, can it fix the damage that's caused by the contam contaminants? So she's working on that. And how interesting is that, right, to think about prenatally, are there interventions that we need to take on on a sex-based difference level with men before they even impregnate their spouses, right? So that's really interesting. We often don't think about these things, right? There was all this hoopla about Zika and how women who may want to get pregnant in the next six months shouldn't go to a Zika area. Well, what about the men? Is that going to affect their sperm? Is, is that something that they should be thinking about as well? It's, it's often not really considered. Here's an example from sort of the policy uh, avenue. I think this program has actually been changed, so we should probably replace it. But at the time uh, when we found it, the prescribed program said physical activity includes strenuous games, and these were for the children's uh, tax credit, uh, strenuous games like hockey or soccer, activities such as golf lessons, horseback riding, sailing, and bowling, as well as others that require a similar level of physical activity. So interesting examples they've chosen here. So my question is, is this policy gender responsive? I would argue not really. A lot of, you know, very, you know, what we would consider more associated with masculine gender norm examples here. Um, and how is that going to make either a girl feel who wants to do something different or a boy feel who wants to do something different or a parent feel about what types of sports are acceptable to put their child in and what constitutes exercise and what constitutes acceptable levels of activity? Where's gymnastics? I mean, uh, where's figure skating? I don't know if any of you have done gymnastics or figure skating, but they're two of the most strenuous exercises that you can do. So to me, they should be on this list just as much as anything else. But my second question is, does this apply an intersectional lens? I mean, golf and horseback riding, sailing? I, I can't, like, I don't know anyone who can afford to put their kids in sailing. And, you know, I mean, horseback riding is super expensive unless you live on a farm, not to mention golf and all the things that are associated with that, right? And are the people that are, you know, putting their kids in horseback riding or golf lessons or sailing the same people that are looking for the children, that are going to benefit most from a children's fitness tax credit? So how have these things been considered in developing this, uh, this list of potential activities, right? Another example is, is, about, uh, is about depression and mental health, and we know that there are differences here, at least observationally, but where they're coming from is, is the big question. We know that women are diagnosed with depression twice as often as men, but men account for three out of four deaths by suicide. Now, there's not a direct, direct causation between depression and suicide. You can actually commit suicide and not technically uh, be considered to be depressed. However, it's obviously there's a, there's a big correlation between the two. So these, this is a very strange paradox that we see. Um, this is a recent uh, survey on men and suicide. Almost one quarter of Canadian men surveyed have considered or attempted suicide. 
and more than half of those indicated they would feel embarrassed about seeking professional help for depression. So could that be leading to what we're seeing in terms of the, the men who complete suicide more? We know that women actually attempt suicide more, but men complete far more than women. So one of the causes of this could be, or a contributing factor, could be the diagnostic methods for depression tend to look for symptoms that may be more common in women, like sadness, crying, and they might actually miss the symptoms that are more, more common among men, like anger and irritability, among others. But we also know, and this is really interesting, that even when men present with the same symptoms as women, clinicians are less likely to diagnose them with depression. So why could that possibly be? Even when they're showing the same symptoms that are in the diagnostic manual that may be more common in women, they're still less likely to be diagnosed. So my question always is, is it sex, is it gender, is it a combination of the two? And we know that it's rarely clear cut to sort of tease apart these concepts. So here's a really good example of that. If you find differences between men and women and people of different genders, do you actually know if the difference is caused by something that's biological or something that's psychosocial? And how can you actually be sure? So this is a... This is an interesting study from, um, from Louise Peltier at McGill, um, and her question was, is sex or gender more predictive of outcomes after acute coronary syndrome? So she was looking at uh, adults under 55 who have had a heart attack and trying to see how likely are they to have a second heart attack within a year of the first, and how do sex and gender uh, affect the likelihood? So what she did was she developed a composite gender score. So this is, you know, one way that you can measure gender. There are so many, and like I said, gender has multiple aspects, right? So this, she, she composed this herself. So the idea was to take a whole bunch of different things that often tend to be associated with gender or femininity and masculinity, and then take her cohort, apply these, you know, these tools, these questionnaires to the cohort, and then see which were more likely to be uh, associated with being biologically male, which were more likely to be associated with being biologically female, and then compose your, your gender tool out of that to say, okay, now that I've seen in my cohort at this time, at this age, in this culture of people in my cohort, this is how these different aspects of gender tend to uh, move along lines of sex. Right? which is really what gender is. It's how we think that people of a particular sex should behave or should look or should whatever it might be or should what they should do with their lives. Right? So it's really taking something that's time-based. Right? And then she developed this composite gender score and, and then reapplied it to her cohort. And what she found was uh, is that this dotted line here is the men. So the men tended to be more along having more of the masculine, what was considered the masculine. So these are the things that happen to be more associated, the gendered things that tend to be more associated with being male, um, whereas the women had a little bit more, uh, let's say, fluid uh, gender profiles along the, the feminine and the masculine characteristics. So, what does, so that was interesting to start with. And then once you reapply that, uh, to see what your results are and how they're mediating the, the likelihood that you have that second heart attack, what she found was that higher feminine gender score, but not female sex, was associated with an increased risk of hypertension, diabetes, family history of cardiovascular disease, and increased depressive and anxious symptoms. So those were out of her composite gender score, whether or not you were biologically male or biologically female, if you had a higher feminine gender score, that was associated with all of these risk factors. So, you know, if you had just sort of looked at that initially and seen a difference between males and females, you might think it's biological if you hadn't bothered to look at, well, you know, what are the other factors that sort of intersect with gender or, you know, what is, what are the other things that are happening in these people's lives that might actually be making this difference appear. So we also know in terms of momentum that public awareness is growing. This stuff has been in the news quite a lot. This is something that was in the news in the summer of last year that um, Ontario fast food labels could cause women to gain weight. So the Ontario legislation that came in was about fast food chains having to display calorie info, 
plus a context statement. So it wasn't just this thing is 500 calories. It was this is 500 calories and the recommended daily calorie intake for adults is. And they had 2,000 to 2,400 calories, which if, if you've ever been a calorie counter in your life, uh, and particularly if you're of the female uh, sex, you know that that's quite high. Uh, the Health Canada recommendations for women, uh, 31 to 50, are actually 1,800 calories a day. So that's quite high and could be very detrimental to women's health if they actually followed that now. It's detrimental to be eating at fast food chains all the time, but you, you, you get the idea. These things, it wasn't, uh, a, a sex and gender lens was not applied here, clearly. Um, so another one from CBC, sexism in most research can lead to medical harm in women scientists warn. So this is uh, Jeff Mogul, who's a researcher at McGill, who says that we have an ethical duty to study female biology. And he systematically studies both male and female animals and has all kinds of really, really interesting uh, results because of it and, and really interesting breakthroughs, like this one where he found that uh, mechanical pain hypersensitivity was actually um, mediated through different cells in the male and the female mice. So you could sort of test that a, that a mouse was feeling pain and then turn off this particular type of cell in the mice, and the male mice stopped feeling pain or stopped reacting to pain, whereas the female mice, there was absolutely no difference. So, you know, this is so interesting. And if you're not looking at males and females, what might you be missing? So this is another one that was in the news, and this was actually on The National, and uh, my boss, the scientific director, Kara Tenenbaum, was interviewed on The National about this, and this was, you know, about how women's periods are seen as a barrier to medical research. Uh, and this, this uh, Jerry Lynn, Dr. Jerry Lynn Pryor said, women are not just men with boobs and tubes, which is, which is something that you hear in our area of work quite a bit, right? Um, so uh, this is, this is uh, something that we hear from biomedical researchers quite a bit, not as much in the clinical, um, at least in, in my area of work, is that we don't want to do, because, you know, you, you ask why. Well, why are they not using the female animals? Well, one of the biggest re reasons that we get is they have estrus cycles, their hormones are, are variable, so we don't want to have to control for the hormone variability. But actually, they're not necessarily more variable. And there was a, there have been two meta-analyses actually in the last two years that have come out. And this one looked at 293 studies and showed equal variability in traits in male and female wide type mice because we think about how females have an estrous cycle, so their hormones are, are, are variable, but males have hormones too, and they are not at a constant rate, right? They, they vary as well. So we actually know that in these various areas, males can actually be more variable in hormones than females. Oftentimes, we suspect because they're actually being housed together, and there's this alpha male syndrome where there's infighting, and it can make the hormones spike. So you can see here along metabolism, hormone, and morphology that the males are actually far more variable than the females. Now, I'm not suggesting that you should do your research exclusively in females. I'm just suggesting that maybe we need to do it in both because uh, it's actually not as much of a problem as, as we might think that it is. So the bottom line on this one is that females do not equal males plus messy variables. There's been this assumption that males are the standard and females are the deviation. They're just, you know, males plus all these messy variables that we have to account for, so we should just do the research in males and then we'll all be fine. Well, guess what? All of those things that are considered messy variables are a reality in females, and if you don't study them and you don't study the females and all of the other things that make them different from males, then you can't actually suggest that your science is generalizable to females. So getting to how do you do this. So here are some resources that I would suggest. Obviously, number one for me is the online training modules. We have three that we've developed and put out. They're interactive. They each take about 35 to 45 minutes to complete. As I mentioned, you get a certificate at the end. Uh, the first one is on biomedical research. The second is on primary data collection with human participants. And the third is the analysis of data collected from human participants. Um, so if you have a uh, if you have a data set and you didn't do the primary data collection and you don't necessarily have a, a gender variable, uh, there are three ways that we provide in that third module to show you how you can actually construct a gender variable from your administrative data set. I'm not going to get into how to do that on this, uh, on this webinar, mostly because it's not my area of expertise, but please do the module if you're interested in doing something like that. 
Um, so the module objectives, for each of the three modules, the objectives are to help you to recognize the nomenclature that are used in sex and gender science, to identify methods that you can use to conduct sex and gender science, and to actually teach you how to critically appraise the integration of sex and gender protocols and publications. So this is if you are a scientist, which uh, you know uh, most are people, scientists who also do peer review. So peer review for a journal or peer review for uh, research funding applications. So it'll show you how to actually critically review as a reviewer and how to do it in your own science as well. So this is what the modules look like. This is from, object this is from module one, the biomedical research. So we ask questions to help uh, develop the learning experience and make it more interactive. So we ask things like, and you know, my boss loves these questions, the really tricky ones, which of these statements is incorrect? Sex refers to a set of biological attributes in humans and animals. Sex is primarily associated with the behaviors of men and women. Sex is usually categorized as female or male. Variation exists in the biological attributes that comprise sex and how those attributes are expressed. And the answer is B. Oh, the incorrect statement, which is the correct answer, is B. So I won't go too into the why of this or, or whatever it is, but I just wanted to give you a sense. This is from the second module uh, in the objective two on how to do it, so the sort of methods part. So just to show you that we have all of these scales, a lot of them are out of date. Um, there are new ones coming and we're adding them all the time, but it shows you that there's gender identity skills, gender role skills, gender norm skills, gender relation skills, and we've got links to them uh, in the, in the um, modules as well as references for all of those and, uh, and the actual links to the tools uh, where they were available. And this is from the third module on the analysis of data from human participants. So another, it's, this is in the third objective that's showing you how to review. So it gives you a, uh, it gives you some examples from actual applications. We got permission from actual applicants who have applied for various funding opportunities at CIHR to use examples. They're obviously anonymized. Uh, use examples that that they've uh, included, both um, successful and unsuccessful applicants. And we've provided small excerpts from their applications that you are given the opportunity to review, you're asked a question, and then you're given an opportunity per, to actually provide comment on it. So just some general principles of applying sex and gender-based analysis in health research, um, and I would say in any area of health, not just health research uh, for the first one here, is to use the terminology appropriately, sex versus gender, because as I've shown you here, there, there are significant differences between the two, and we really want to be clear about what it is that we're talking about. If, you're, if you want to figure out the mechanisms, you have to understand what it is that you're talking about, and others need to as well. Uh, for research comprising organisms capable of differentiation by sex, I have a friend who does cancer research in androgynous worms, uh, so that's why this one's highlighted, uh, because he's constantly telling me that what I have to say has no bearing on what he does. Uh, studies should be designed in a way that can reveal sex-related differences, even if they were not initially expected. So this is really important. You know, a lot of people who do mouse research get really upset with us and say, you want me to double my animals, it's going to cost a lot of money, are you going to give me more money? And, and we say, no, we don't want you to double your animals, uh, we just want you to make half of them male and half of them female, right? Uh, you know, you, we're not asking you to do sex differences research, which is an important distinction. You should be able to detect if there are differences, but we're not asking you to study those differences. We just want you to make sure that you have a representative sample for the population that this is meant to eventually be applicable to. Um, just don't try to generalize your studies to a population that you're not actually studying. Um, so number three, if subjects can also be differentiated by gender, uh, so in, in clinical research involving humans, population-based studies, or you know whatever it is that involves humans, very important, the research should be conducted similarly uh, at this additional level of distinction. So those are sort of the three basic things to consider. So some basic steps that you should, you should consider, and I'll give you some more detail on this in a tool. Uh, is, you know, obviously the literature review is important. Look up things like, uh, you know, uh, sex differences, sexual dimorphism, gender differences in whatever topic it is that you're studying. Uh, study, uh, this in the study design and methods, think critically about sex and gender as they relate to study design, population target, recruitment, uh, selection of study variables and questionnaires. 
Uh, and your analysis and your reporting, very important, because these things are coming along, the journals are changing. The integration of sex and gender into the data analysis and the reporting is critical to maximize the output of investment in the data collection process. And also knowledge translation, this is an emerging area, and we've actually just funded a grant on this, looking at the differences between men and women and gender diverse people and how gender might actually affect uh, the, the success of knowledge translation and implementation science intervention. So it's important to sort of walk through that and consider how sex and gender might actually be important variables in determining how you disseminate your research and how you do integrated knowledge translation and how you deal with knowledge users. Um, this is an example of a tool that we have and you'll get a, you'll get a link on, uh, at the end of the, the presentation with a tools page that we have on our website and includes these checklists. So they're just some checklists to get you thinking about various ways and areas in your application uh, for funding where you could think about how to integrate sex and gender along the way. So when you're collecting sex and gender data, and I, I decided to include this as an example because I get this question a lot. As I mentioned, the, the ethics boards uh, and, the, and the researchers are contacting us about this. There's no necessarily um, agreed upon, perfect way of considering sex and gender in surveys, but there are ways that are worse than others, I would argue. So I'll give you, some, I'll give you an example. So it's important to think about that sex, is, sex and gender are not a binary. It's not if you're male, you're man, if you're woman, you're female, right? It's not a binary. There's many things in between. You can be one sex and be a different gender and, and all these other things and, and not really adhere to typical gender norms. Um, so on a questionnaire survey, you need to consider, do you need to ask about sex? Do you need to ask about gender? Do you need to ask about both? And have you thought about why you're asking? And this is so important because you might actually be using sex or gender as a proxy for other information. You might be asking, are you a woman or a man? Gender, woman, man. And what it's actually what you actually want to know is, you know, are you a person who should have had a, a PAP in the last two years, right? Which is a completely different thing from is your gender man or woman, right? Those are completely different things. So you really need to consider what are you trying to get at? Do you want to know if they are XX or XY and you're asking what's your gender? Or you're asking, you know, are you male or female or other? Is that really going to tell you what you want? Are people going to interpret that question the same way, right? Are you trying to get at someone's social experience and you're going to use that to sort of apply it and, and use it alongside other variables to determine how something might be affecting people socially based on that question? And should you be asking different questions to get those answers rather than sex and gender? I think it's important to think about asking sex and gender. And I really think it's important to, to ask those questions so that particularly in studies that may eventually be used in a meta-analysis or systematic review, that that data exists. But it's important to think about how it's relating to your analysis and how you're actually using that data. Oops. So this is sort of the typical thing we see, which I call the one-step method. We ask, what is your sex? Or sometimes we say, what is your gender? And we have male, female, or sometimes we add other. And like I said, you know, what is this information actually telling you and what are you assuming by the fact that you've actually, by the, the, the answer that you get from that and what are you actually missing and do you know how people are going to interpret it? So something that's better and not necessarily perfect but certainly better is a two-step question where you ask both sex and gender identity questions. So what is your current agenda, gender identity? And then followed quickly by, or, or following quickly, uh, what sex were you assigned at birth, meaning on your original birth certificate, and at least that way you're giving people an opportunity to say, oh, they want to know my biology here, but they're also giving me an opportunity to identify how I currently identify in terms of my gender. So that reduces the chances that people are going to misunderstand. It doesn't make anyone feel, you know, othered by making them check other, right? And it gives people an opportunity to, you know, and this is changing all the time, to provide a different identity than those that are listed and to specify it, which is really interesting and it allows us to track how these things are changing over time and, and how people are identifying over time and how that might actually affect their health outcomes. So here's another tool that I find really helpful, particularly when we're talking about health programs and policies. So this is just a way to assess where you're at on the scale, right? So we want to avoid policies, initiatives, uh, interventions that are going to exploit uh, gender stereotypes or perpetuate gender inequality. Obviously, that's bad. Now, 
We also know now, and, and hopefully we're moving beyond this, is this idea, like I mentioned, that being gender blind and pretending everyone's the same is fair and just. We know that it's not. People are different. Different people have different privileges and lack certain privileges, and if we treat them all the same, we're perpetuating those things and those, those inequities. If something is gender sensitive, and this is moving up the scale, it considers gender norms, roles, and relations, but maybe doesn't try to actually change anything that's going on, but at least it considers them. Something that's gender specific is something that targets a specific uh, target audience of a particular gender. So it could be men, it could be boys, it could be girls, it could be women, it could be uh, transgender individuals, people who are identify as gender queer, it could, whatever it might be. It's very specific to a target group and aims to benefit that particular group. Gender transformative, which I would argue is the gold standard, and this could also be gender specific, um, is something that has a, what I call a double bottom line. So it's aiming to address the, the cause of the gender-based health inequity at the same time that it's trying to uh, include ways to transform the harmful gender norms, roles, and relations. So your intervention might be aimed at reducing HIV AIDS transmission, but at the same time it's aiming to reduce the gender inequities that might make particular gendered groups more susceptible to uh, HIV transmission, right? So gender is gender transformative is the double bottom line, and the underlying assumption behind doing work that's gender transformative is that we can do better. So the idea is the ends, so the better health outcome, doesn't justify the means if you're exploiting gender stereotypes. Right? And I think we've all seen examples of this where gender stereotypes are being exploited and it might be something that's really flashy and great and it might work. You know, a really great example is the, or maybe bad example is the Red Dress campaign, if you may have seen it from the Heart and Stroke Foundation. They did a commercial or a PSA where the woman is having a heart attack and she's running around trying to get her family ready for school and get her husband ready for work and she's having a heart attack and she's having heart attack symptoms but she's not recognizing them as heart attack symptoms because sometimes women have you know, heart attack symptoms that are different from the ones that we know about, which are more typical in men. And then finally, you know, her son gets her to call 911 as he's out the door, and, you know, the ambulance says, we'll be there in five minutes, and she looks around and sees how messy the kitchen is and says, can you be here in 10, right, as she's on the floor having a heart attack. So, ha, 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 it's really funny and it's flashy and gets people's attention, and it may improve a health outcome by getting women and men more aware of what, what heart attack symptoms women might have that are different from males' heart attack symptoms. But what could we have done uh, that wouldn't have exploited gender stereotypes that should suggest that women have to, you know, do everything and be everything for everyone, like this woman was trying to be, and, you know, trying to clean her house at the same time as she's having a heart attack, you know, maybe the answer was, and, and maybe there's a, you know, sexier way of doing this, but maybe her, if her husband had been helping her in the morning, she would have had time to Google heart attack symptoms or Google her symptoms and figure out what's going on rather than having a heart attack and all of her family is gone and she's trying to clean up the kitchen before the paramedics arrive, right? So just thinking through those things, what's sort of the next step that we can take? Is there a better way that we can do this? And what we actually know, and some people would say, oh, but as long as you get the, the symptoms out and as long as people know, well, actually what we know from a World Health Organization report is that interventions that are gender transformative are actually more effective than, than, than those that are not, those that not only might be, you know, perpetuating stereotypes, but those that maybe aren't but just aren't aiming to be gender transformative. The gender transformative programs are actually 41% effective versus an overall rate of effectiveness of 29% of, of uh, interventions. So that's really interesting, and for me, that's a really strong argument for why we should try to take that next step. So more resources for you, and this, uh, this link will be shared, is the Sex and Gender and Health Research Guide. It's not just for health researchers. There's lots of stuff on there. This is on our website. It has definitions, guidance documents, those checklists that I showed you. It has fact sheets that are plain language, that are really easy to understand. They're for anyone. Uh, there's videos and webinars on there from some of our wonderful researchers talking a little bit more in depth about what they do, uh, key articles and reports, and of course, a uh, link to our training modules as well. So that's it from me. Um, we have time for questions and discussion, if we like. Uh, so I will, I think I'm moving it, passing the ball over. 
Yep, that looks great. Thank you so much, Crystal. What an excellent, uh, engaging presentation. Um, I know I learned a, I learned a ton. Um, I did not know how much I did not know, but it turns out it was a lot. So um, this was really eye-opening, and I, I certainly enjoyed that. Um, I'm just going to move to our slide that just illustrates exactly how you can post to the chat. Uh, we'll give a couple of minutes for people to type in their, their questions and discussion uh, comments. Um, you can post them to chat, and then please make sure that you send the questions to all participants um, as opposed to privately to host so that everybody can see your questions as well. Um, and please make sure you stick around for the discussion and the question period. We have a couple of more polling questions that we'll do once that's over. Um, Crystal, I really enjoyed the presentation. Um, one thing that Thanks. stood out to me, I can, I can start with a, with a, with a question. Um, I never thought about um, labeling uh, drugs differently for men and women, um, yeah. and I thought your, I mean, the data on, on even just Tylenol was, was really striking. Do you think we'll ever see um, gender, or sorry, now I'm using the wrong word, sex-specific uh, labels on uh, medications? Well, we have seen that. One of my examples was Ambien, the sleeping pill. We have actually seen sex-specific uh, dosing on Ambien in Canada and the states where women's recommended dose is half the dose of that that's recommended for males. And uh, we certainly hope that that will be the case. We know that uh, Health Canada has guidelines on, uh, on doing sex and gender-based analysis for you know, any sort of health products. And um, we're really hoping to see some teeth put on that, those guidelines in, in the future to, to make sure that those things are being um, done by the pharma companies and that we're looking at it properly and, and making sure that if there are differences, we know about them and that we can label things appropriately and make those, those recommendations for sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's yeah, the dream. Um, I wonder if there needs to be any education of the public as well. I wonder if people would look at that and say, oh, that's just because men are bigger or, you know, mm -hmm. and think it's a body mass type of thing as opposed to an actual... Physiology um, issue, Absolutely. but um, yeah, that's that's really interesting. Yeah, um, we have a we have a thanks that's come in. I think somebody really enjoyed the presentation there as well. Yeah, um, that's one of my colleagues from Health Canada. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jennifer. So, um, I had another question about powering studies, and I know you want to mm -hmm. make sure that um, you have a, a relatively equal split between male and female in terms of your subject participants. And I remember um, in some courses, one of the examples that was used was, was aspirin. They did a study on aspirin, and then they did an inadequately powered subgroup, subgroup analysis. And they found that, mm -hmm. oh, um, aspirin doesn't have a preventative effect in, in women, so they didn't recommend aspirin for women. And then they did the mm -hmm. properly powered study and found out that, oh, we really should be recommending it for women to prevent uh, uh, heart attack and stroke, and um, I'm wondering if, if any of the recommendations that come from CIHR have anything to do with adequately powering those types of subgroup analyses as well. I mean, I think it's a bit of a leap from from the clinical studies to, like, the way that you're making it sound, it sounds like one study determined how what the recommendations were, which is not yeah. usually the case, right? You have to have multiple, multiple, multiple studies that go mm -hmm. into a systematic review, and we know it takes, you know, 17 years before these mm -hmm. things get into practice. So, you know, we're certainly just, as I said, recommending that your study be powered to detect sex differences so that if you wanted to or someone else wanted to down the line replicate and do it with a, so that it's powered to actually study the sex differences, that then you're able to do that. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, I would hope that that inadequately powered subgroup analysis wasn't actually changing medical practice, right? I think this may have been a couple of decades ago and was used as an example. Maybe. Yeah, it's yeah. one that I've always remembered, so. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's interesting to think about, but um, yeah, I would just hope that those things are just very initial stages and that they're just basically used to improve the knowledge we have about a particular subject and so that it can be studied in greater depth and then hopefully get into, get into practice. Mm -hmm. Uh, we have another question here. Um, how should samples be selected for diseases believed to have a gender difference in prevalence? Uh, for example, rheumatoid arthritis believed to affect women more than men, where in a general population, uh, two-thirds to three-quarters of uh, patients are women. Um, so the, it's believed to have a gender difference? or it's, it's Yeah, it seems like there's a gender objective. difference in prevalence. So if you were to do a study, I guess, on people with rheumatoid arthritis, would you want a 50-50 split or would you want your study patients to represent 
the real world prevalence is, is how I'm reading um, that question. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, my feeling is that it depends on what it's about and what your specific question is, right? Um, I hate to say it depends, but I should also <laughs> tell you this is not my specific area of, of knowledge and education. So that question might be a little bit too in-depth for me, but my feeling is that it's going to depend on the research question. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Good. So we'll wait for more questions to come in. Um, while we're waiting for questions, we'll move on to our last couple of polling questions. Um, the second last of which is whether or not you think that this tool, um, so the online training modules, whether or not you think that they might be useful in your practice. Um, so the polling question is open now. Again, make sure that you uh, uh, hit submit so that your answer actually um, is submitted to us as well. Um, it looks like a number of people do think this will be very useful. Um, I know mm -hmm. I know my experience here was there really is a lot more to consider than, than you might have might have known about. So this was really, really eye opening. Um, so yeah, everybody's saying um, either somewhat or mostly very useful, so that's really, really mm -hmm. encouraging. We, we're glad that you found that this uh, was a useful tool to highlight during the webinar. Um, and then again, um, I believe I mentioned this at the beginning, um, your feedback is very important to us. Um, the Spotlight series, we're, we're always looking to help improve um, and plan future webinars based on demand and um, tailoring it to what your objectives are and how uh, what you would like to get out of this series. So please take a couple of minutes to share your thoughts on today's webinar. Uh, the survey is available at that link, which has also been posted in the chat section. Um, and I believe the survey link will also pop up uh, when you close this window. So we do encourage you, really, I think it's maybe six questions. So uh, we'd really appreciate it if you can uh, complete that. Um, and then our last polling question for today, um, we're interested in um, what are your next steps? Um, so following today's presentation, um, are you looking, do you think you'd be accessing the online modules, um, reading the registry summary about the modules, um, consider using the modules in your practice, or telling a, uh, somebody that you work with about the module, somebody that you think this might be uh, useful for? This question is a little bit different. You can actually select um, as many answers as you would like. And again, we ask that you just make sure that you hit submit so that the answer gets recorded. Um, and that's great. It looks like we've got a pretty even split among them. So that's really great. It looks like actually quite a few people will be accessing the, the tool. So, um, right. Krista, you can look for more traffic to those modules. So that'll be Excellent. really great. Um, before we move on, I'm just going to move back to questions because I think we've had another one come in. Um, or at least a comment. So um, this was an interesting presentation. Thanks for highlighting the misuse of the two concepts. Um, and the commenter admits that uh, he has been a culprit on wrong use of the two variables. So um, it's great when we're aware of, of where we can improve. And um, I think that's, that's one of the main things that we'll all be taking away from this presentation. Definitely. And don't feel bad. You're not alone. <laughs> That's great. So um, now the Spotlight webinar series from NCCMT, we are taking a break for the summer. We will resume in September. We've got a really great presentation booked for September. Um, we do have a number of other uh, webinars through other series coming up. So we've highlighted one here um, coming up in two weeks on Wednesday, May 17th. This is a webinar that we'll be hosting in uh, collaboration with uh, NCCEH for environmental health. And we'll be presenting a case study on using evidence and um, evidence-based methods and tools for making a policy change to reduce carbon monoxide exposure in long-term care facilities. So uh, Dr. Susan Snelling from uh, NCCMT and then Daniel Fong, uh, very, very knowledgeable from NCCEH, will be presenting at this webinar. Uh, the link has been posted in the chat section as well, and we would love to see you at that one as well. Um, so I have not seen any other questions come in. Uh, Crystal, again, we can't thank you enough. I know it's a busy time of year for everybody, so <laughs> we really appreciate you taking the time to prepare and uh, present this presentation. I know I certainly enjoyed it, um, and it looks like um, everybody else did as well. So um, if anybody's interested in more information um, about the National Collaborating Center for Methods and Tools, our website and our contact information is on the screen um, as well as in the chat box for you. We appreciate everybody coming out today, and we hope to see you at the next one. And um, I'll pass it back to Crystal in case you have any more comments. 
that's it. Just wanted to really thank you for having me. It's it's a great experience to be able to share this stuff with with everyone, especially everyone who seems so interested and and eager to use the tools. So happy to happy to help. Wonderful, Crystal. Thank you so much, and thanks again to everybody who's joined.